Approaching Quad 01, Captain. fellow Spelunkers for episode number Snazzy 17. As you can see, I am almost detunified and should be back to my regular handsome self by next episode. This episode, we are going to follow up our look at the Xenomorph Alien with a look at the Predator or the Yatya. We have another fine selection of internet videos, stolen memes, and assorted other bullshit shenanigans. So without further ado, let's go balls deep on this episode. Oh. He's enraged! He's absolutely enraged. And now, still. Oh, oh my god! Oh my god! Stumps to the face! And I don't think yeah. Jeff A. Steel was ready for this. Uh oh. Psycho! Oh my god! Oh! 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 Oh my lord. Oh my lord. You're better than that. Get a shot of this. As, 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 I need! I need my steel! I need! Just me! Welcome back to another episode of Some Shit About. I am your host, Rubix. We are following up our last episode on the Xenomorph of the Alien movies with the Yautwa of the Predator series. The Yautya, known colloquially as the Predators or Hunters, are an extraterrestrial species characterized by their hunting of other dangerous species for sport and honor, including humans. The Yautia are a sentient, humanoid race that breathe an atmosphere similar to that of Earth's, but possess a level of technological advancement far in excess of anything available to humans. The predators stalk and kill their prey using a combination of highly advanced technology, such as active camouflage and energy weapons, combined with comparatively primitive traditional weapons, such as splades, spears, and nets. The predators often ritualistically mutilate their prey and usually claim a trophy from their kills. Capable of interstellar travel in starships, the predators have hunted on Earth for centuries and have also had prior contact with the engineers. They have been known to deliberately breed xenomorphs in order to hunt them, often as part of initiation rituals for young predators. Aside from their repeated conflicts with humans, the Predators have notably been associated with Xenomorph XX121, known to them as Kionde Ameda, Hard Meat, whom they revere as perhaps the most worthy of all prey. They have been known to breed the creatures from captive queens, employing them in rite of passage trials that serve as an initiation ritual for young hunters, and even artificially seeding planets with Xenomorphs to hunt. The Yotya have a code of honor that it expects all members of his species to adhere to on pain of not being seen as a true Yotya, and therefore subject to being destroyed. Therefore most Yotya are molded around that code, being ruthless but honorable, with the exception of bad bloods. Aggression and arrogance seems to be innate in hunters, especially young males. Predators are bipedal humanoids, physically distinguishable from humans by their greater height, the long, hair-like appendages on their heads, nicknamed dreadlocks, their reptilian skin, and their faces, which feature arthropod-like mandibles and no visible nose. The biological purpose of the distinctive mandibles is unclear. Some have proposed that they may be used in reproduction or mating rituals. They may also be a vestigial piece of anatomy, as noted by Lex Woods, who compares it to the human appendix. The Yautia use them to convey emotions. For example, Flared mandibles apparently signify anger or surprise. Mandibles clicking together can signify interest or curiosity. And Yautja had even been said to grin with them. Predators have also been known to employ their mandibles as weapons, using them to inflict grievous bite wounds on their opponent. 
as well as the fleshy dreadlocks around the side of the head, some predators have also been seen to possess sparse quills on their cheeks and above the eyes. While generally uniform, each Yautja's physical appearance includes a number of subtle variations akin to human genetic diversity. Similarly, while predator heights vary, they are typically over 7 feet tall, although some have been known to grow to 8 feet or even taller. Despite this, shorter individuals have been recorded, such as Monde, or the aptly named Shorty, who stood the height of a typical human. These individuals are unusual, and their smaller height the subject of ridicule in Yautja society. The species' reptile-like skin can range in color from light to dark, be mottled or clear, and can appear dry or moist and clammy. Yautja are highly resilient to physical damage, capable of recovering from multiple gunshot wounds with minimal or even no medical attention, and surviving radi radiation doses which would be fatal to humans. They are also highly resilient to most bacteria and viruses. They are incredibly strong, easily capable of outmatching a conditioned adult human male in unarmed combat, and able to land blows that can shatter solid concrete. They are capable of tearing a human's head and spine from the body with little effort, while some larger specimens have even been seen to tear a human body in half using only their bare hands. This strength evidently extends to their lower bodies as well, as predators have been seen to jump up to three times their own height and are capable of falling up to ten times their height and landing safely on their feet. They are skilled climbers and in fact appear to prefer moving at height through trees or across rooftops in pursuit of prey, typically jumping from one vantage point to the next. Though capable of surviving exposure and in Antarctic temperatures for an extended period of time, it seems as though predators have a preference for hot equatorial climates. According to Isabella Borgia, Yautja possess superior genetic material compared to humans that, if used correctly, could enhance humanity as a species. The augmentation of Hunter Borgia was one such project carried out in this regard, although the genetic experimentation was not completed before Hunter was slain by the Yautja known as Scarface. Nevertheless, Yautja genes are evidently potent enough that when one is impregnated with a xenomorph chestburster, the resulting creature adopts more pronounced physical characteristics from its host than might otherwise be expected, such as dreadlocks and mandibles, leading to the distinctive predalian caste. Their blood is luminescent phosphor green in color and has the capacity to partially neutralize the acidity of xenomorph blood. It has also been known to bestow significant life-giving properties on humans capable of extending a person's lifespan well beyond what would normally be possible. It is thought Yautja may be cold-blooded, hence their documented affinity for hot, humid conditions and the thermal netting built into their suits. Predator's vision operates mainly in the infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. They can easily detect heat differentials in their surroundings, but are unable to easily distinguish among objects of the same relative temperature. A predator's helmet, or bio-helmet, greatly increases its ability to see in a variety of spectrums, ranging from the low infrared to the high ultraviolet, and also filters ambient heat from the area, allowing them to distinguish prey with greater clarity and detail. While they are seemingly capable of breathing Earth's atmosphere, they have been known to use some sort of breathing apparatus in the event of losing their bio-helmet. Predators' dietary habits are not clearly established Although the city hunter that stalked Los Angeles was known to visit a slaughterhouse in the city every two days to feed on the meat stored there, suggesting a carnivorous or perhaps omnivorous diet. In one instance, a contamination caused by chemical AO3959X.91-15 drove a mutated predator to cannibalize one of the last members of its own hunting squad. While the maximum or typical lifespan of a predator is not known, it is accepted as being well in excess of human lifespans, and it has been implied that predator elders can live for hundreds to thousands of years. One predator, called Kalakta, is said to be thousands of years old. He comments that human life hurries as if eager to its end, in comparison to a Yautja's lifespan. Predators possess their own language, both in spoken and written form, the performer of which resembles a series of clicks, 
roars, snarls, and growls. They also have dialects, which deviate sharply enough from the Yauche common tongue that translators cannot make heads or tails of it. The written language is expressed in a pattern of dashes not dissimilar in form and function to many earth-based languages. These written symbols appear on the creature's gauntlet displays, helmets, architecture, and many other services. Predators regularly imitate human speech that they overhear. It is unclear to what degree the Yautya can comprehend this speech, although the creatures at least seem to hold some understanding of the language, as they have been known to repeat phrases at vaguely appropriate times as a form of communication with prey. Older predators, with more experience among humans, have on occasion been known to actually learn to speak English, at least to a limited extent. It has been known for humans and Yautya to successfully communicate using sign language. There is evidence that Yautya can understand the concept of humor. For example, during events on Bouvet Island, the predator Scar deliberately caused a deceased xenomorph to shoot out its inner jaw and startle Lex, and her shock and fear apparently gave Scar some amusement. According to Machiko Noguchi, laughter is universal, even in their species, and the predator equivalent of a belly laugh is the rapid clicking of their tusks. Additionally, as demonstrated by the jungle and city hunters, while individual yautyas make different sounds, a very common sound emitted by them is a high-pitched, human-like shriek, mainly used while their medikits are addressing their wounds. When given a compliment from a higher authority, similarly ranked yautya will touch the hair of the complimentee in acknowledgement. Yautya technology is distinctive in many respects, not the least of which is its unusual combination of ornate tribal appearance masking deadly sophisticated weaponry. However, despite the species' of obvious technological prowess, including access to adaptive camouflage and plasma weaponry, traditional ancient weapons such as blades, knives, and spears are still employed widely and apparently considered by the Yautja as being more honorable than advanced technology. At least one Yautja weapon uses a metal that does not correspond to any known element on the periodic table, and many devices have been shown to be completely resistant to the effects of the acidic blood of xenomorphs, an otherwise incredibly corrosive and destructive substance. With this said, however, the wrist blades and chest armor of immature young blood Yautja are still made of metal that is not resistant to xenomorph blood. It seems such advanced armor must be earned through initiation rituals that first test the individual's prowess with more rudimentary and challenging equipment. Many of the Yautya's tools make use of thermal imaging to track prey, while some aspects of their technology have been in use for millennia. Individuals of the species will often utilize their own bespoke variation of tried and tested Yautya weapons, constructed from different materials and with varying degrees of tribal or symbolic ornamentation. Yautja culture centers on the ritualistic hunting of other dangerous life forms, and this practice appears to be the foundation of their very society. Predators will travel huge distances, even across entire galaxies, in order to face opponents they consider a worthy challenge, and may also kidnap and transport prey across similar distances to bring such victims to a hunting ground of their choice. Defeat in a hunt is apparently a cause of great shame to the Yautja, and often leads to the individual committing honorable suicide, typically through the detonation of their wrist gauntlet self-destruct device. Upon their death, a hunting Yautja spacecraft will return to the species' homeworld on automatic pilot so that a record of the individual's hunt, recorded through their biohelmet, may be returned to its kin. The Yautja society appears to be a heavily gendered one, even the names of the predators tend to have a masculine and feminine connotation, similar to many romantic languages such as Spanish. Male names often end with E, example, Dashande, Tishande, Skante, Megande, etc. While female names tend to end with I, Vaguzi, Haroshore. Dashande even nicknames Mashiko Noguchi, Dadtui Di, which is the feminine form of that name. Some names, such as Larnitsva, Bakub and Warakha do not fit into this naming trend, however. This could be because the names are unisex, or that different clans have different naming convictions. Unblooded are the unrefined hunters of the future. Unblooded Yautja are young predators who haven't completed basic training. They are, or are close to, physically mature adults. 
most unblooded and therefore subsequent classes are male, but female hunters do exist, implying a minor minority of them within the hunting body. Young blood. Young adult Yatwa, who yet to be seen as adults and true hunters in the eyes of the clan mates, these hunters are refined enough to overpower a skilled human fighter, however, their skill against a xenomorph varies. Once they kill one, Yatwa mark themselves with xenomorph blood completing their initiation into adulthood. Blooded. These Yautia have successfully killed their first xenomorph, and given it is such a broad title, skills vary. Once a Yautia is blooded, females will begin to pay him mind for breeding purposes, and his rank could deviate into more specific ones. Elite. Elites encompass the more dangerous of the Yautia race. They have the skill to take on several xenomorph at once, including large, dangerous castes such as Praetorians, Predalians, and even Queens. Elites seem to take on some of the more nuanced, lengthy, and taxing problems and missions in the Yautja world. These can be assigned, as in the case of Dark, or self-volunteered, as in the cast of Wolf. Leader. A leader is a Yautja who has been selected or volunteers to lead and teach unblooded hunters. They appear to be specialized version of the elite rank. Elder, the older, wiser members of the Yautja race. Many of them are clan leaders. Two elders have been seen on screen thus far, and both have been gifted non-predator species with mementos of a good hunt. Ancient, ancients are very old Yautja, some of which are responsible for creating the laws by which the species abides. To this end, they use enforcers to put an end to crime, both within and without the species. Matriarch. A matriarch is the female counterpart to a clan leader. While clan leaders rule in off-world affairs, matriarchs rule and command Yautja crime, and presumably any other world they inhabit, among one of the highest titles in the species. Of all their prey, the Yautja apparently have a special hunting relationship with the xenomorphs, which they refer to as serpents. They seem to consider the voracious alien life forms to be the ultimate prey, and correspondingly, have a reverence for the creatures. The Yautja have been known to specifically breed the creatures at numerous sites for use in the initiation hunts undertaken by young bloods. To this end, the Yautja are known to capture and imprison xenomorph queens, using their eggs to breed lesser castes to hunt. Some of these captured queens have apparently been imprisoned for tens of thousands of years. Yautja have also been known to seed worlds with xenomorphs so that they may be hunted there, infecting the local fauna and then engaging the resulting creatures. Large statues of xenomorphs can often be found in and around Yauta hunting tramples and ruins. It is at this point that I will break and we will continue this in a second part in our follow-up episode. I stole your meme! This man is tearing up this park. Look at him. Um, no, no fox. I'm pretty sure he's drunk too. Oh gee. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, that's it, man. Better call her quits. <laughs> Easy going on the off ramp there. Look at her putting her in four wheel drive. Give her. Oh, god damn Spinning tires. Are you stuck? I'm stuck. 
Fucking right. Oh yeah, put her in four low. There you go. No, he's good. He's good. He's giving her. Shooting rocks. Whoa. Tonight, the 24th century begins. Welcome to the Enterprise. In a special world premiere movie, Star Trek, The Next Generation. Ready for departure, sir. Engage. 78 years have passed since the days of the original USS Enterprise. Now a new Galaxy Starship has been designed with a new team of highly skilled Federation explorers. Starfleet Captain Jean-Luc Picard, Commander Riker, Executive Officer, Chief Medical Officer Crusher, and her brilliant son, Wesley. Lieutenant Commander Data, an android. The telepathic Troy. Jordy, a man with unique vision. Security Officer Yar, and Klingon Officer Worf. Shields and deflectors up, sir. Go to yellow alert. Their first mission, investigate a new star base on planet Denim 4. Thou art directed to return to thine own solar system immediately. The USS Enterprise, NCC 1701D. The first new galaxy class starship is launched with veteran Jean-Luc Picard in command. The ship's first mission is a puzzling one. While picking up new crew members from Deneb 4 on the rim of explored space, they must figure out how the low-technology Bandai there could have built the gleaming new Farpoint station they now offer to the Federation for use as a base. The new ship is almost sidetracked permanently by a being claiming to be part of an all-knowing super race known as the Q. This Q, who considers humanity too barbarous to expand further, hijacks Picard's command crew and sentences them to death in a kangaroo court. Picard is able to save their lives only by offering to prove humanity's worth during his ship's upcoming mission to Farpoint. Freed by Q and allowed to arrive there, the crew can find no explanation for the Bandai's mysterious new technology until a vast alien ship appears and opens fire on the old Bandai city. Q tries to goad Picard into firing on the newcomer, but the Enterprise away team finds that the attacker is actually a sentient life form, trying to free its mate from the Bandai's clutches. Farpoint Station, it turns out, was built entirely by this enslaved creature. As the freed aliens leave the planet, a disappointed Q vows he'll be back to test humanity yet again. Ready. Fight! The baby they show! Uh, you're supposed to be thinking this one! Excuses! You missed your son's birthday! Excuses! Super fast! Wow! Wait, wait, wait! You can't do that! Fort! Oh, you bitch! Fort! Oh, you bitch! D N A T! Finish her! We'll find out. We're gonna find out right now. In the case of four-year-old Brayden, Lante, you are not... <laughs> Daddy, Daddy wins! <laughs> Welcome to Bow Valley. Paid for by the Bow Valley Tourist Board. Welcome, unworthy ones. Now sit down and shut up while I drop some knowledge on your puny brains. Assassin Vines These mobile carnivorous plants can be found in the less traveled parts of Bow Valley and come in two variations. The first is a green and viney form with serrated leaves that resemble clawed hands. This is the more common of the two and has claimed more than one unwary adventurer. The second type is a subterranean form that looks more like roots and grows in underground caves and dungeons. Both should be avoided. That is all I have for you today. Now be gone with this morsel or be destroyed. Ay, 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 ay,
Carl Zante, a.k.a. The Acrobat. First appearance, Strange Tales, number 106, 1963. Height, 5 foot 11, weight, 190 pounds. Eyes brown, hair black. The Acrobat is an expert gymnast and tumbler who incorporates various flips and leaps into his fighting style. He is quite shrewd and able to outwit and manipulate others. He also has access to expensive equipment such as an asbestos lined truck, a high tech rocket equipped sky platform, and a liquid asbestos gun capable of dousing flames. He also carries a handgun for when his other methods fail him. It is suspected that Zante is actually independently wealthy, or perhaps financed by a wealthy ally, and committed his crimes purely for adventure. <laughs> 